draft's passage of this bill. We submit uh, our memorandum, which we have submitted in writing already, merely to underscore that support, but also to highlight and propose changes to certain aspects and portions of the current bill that, in our opinion, require further reflection, modification, and fine-tuning in order to achieve the policy goals and objectives set forth in the memorandum to the bill. Because of the constraint of time, I shall not be going through the point-by-point, -point, clause by clause analysis of the bill that we actually undertook. Uh, but I'll just give you some highlights uh, and then uh, 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 some highlights of what it is that we think of the bill. Before doing this analysis, we proceeded, we, we set ourselves certain general principles as guidelines. So we used certain general principles, which principles were drawn from our study of various anti-corruption documents, including the UN uh, uh, documents on anti-corruption. We looked at the J Jakarta principles on um, uh, anti-corruption agencies. And also we studied various anti-corruption bodies globally to look at the successful ones and the not so successful ones, and then teased out a number of principles, which we believe are the principles by which not only our analysis must be guided, but also this bill must be guided uh, because those principles reflect the successful cases of anti-corruption bodies. And therefore, we think it's important to take those into account uh, when looking at this bill. And we've set forth those principles in the beginning of our memorandum. Uh, to, to, to begin, let me just make uh, a quick remark about the constitutional uh, controversy around the bill. We recognize that Article 88.3 indeed represents the single most significant constitutional hurdle that the OSP bill must overcome. But that provision does not ipso facto render the idea of a special office of special prosecutor infeasible under the terms of the 1992 constitution. In the first place, the constitutional conferral on the attorney general of exclusive responsibility, and that's the word, for prosecution does not mean that the prosecutorial authority and function must be lodged in or exercised exclusively by the person of the attorney general. Indeed, as Section 4 of Article 88 proceeds to make clear, a statutory delegation of prosecution authority to other persons is anticipated and permissible and not inconsistent with the AG's exclusive responsibility for prosecution. So there are currently, in fact, a number of persons or public officers duly authorized by the Attorney General to exercise delegated prosecutorial power pursuant to various statutes in currently in force, including the Legal Services Act, uh, PNDC uh, Law 320, the Law Officers Act 1974, NRCD 279, Section 56 of the Criminal and Other Offenses uh, uh, Procedure Act 1960, Act 30. All of these laws uh, authorize the Attorney General to delegate powers to persons uh, who exercise authority as agents of the Attorney General. So the principal constitutional challenge that this office, new, newly proposed office, represents, uh, presents is indeed how to design or structure the relationship between the Attorney General on the one hand and the Office of Special Prosecutors so as to ensure compliance with both sections three and four of Article 88. We believe that compliance with these two provisions of Article 88 means at least two things. One, the Attorney General must play a central role in the appointment of the Special Prosecutor because the power of prosecution, though it is generally part of the executive power, is a power that lawyers will call a power sui generis. It is a power that's one of a kind. It is the only executive power that is carved out of the president's power and located specifically in the attorney general. So if any of that power is to be parceled out or reassigned, 
uh, by legislation, it is our view that the Attorney General must play a central role in the selection, in the process leading to the selection of the person to be the Special Prosecutor. The second implication uh, that flows out of Article uh, 88 is that the operational independence of the Special Prosecutor must be balanced against the appropriate accountability. And I think this is something that we often miss, that independence does not mean license to do as one pleases, and that independence must always be coupled with accountability to ensure appropriate use of power that is delegated. So the operational independence or autonomy of the special prosecutor must be balanced against appropriate accountability of the office to the office of the attorney general so as to ensure that the attorney general remains, as per the terms of Article 88.3, retains overall responsibility for the prosecutorial function. The question is how do you, what degree of independence do you give on the front end and what degree of accountability do you exact on the back end to ensure that this balance is accomplished. We believe that the bill does a very good job of trying to wrestle with this difficulty and, and, and we think that further deliberation on it is important. For us, what we consider special about the special prosecutor it's not really the question of independence or lack of it. Independence can come in, in many different forms. It could be legal independence, it could be operational independence, or it could be actually empirical independence. There are many bodies that are not necessarily constituted as independent bodies and yet in fact operate that way. So ultimately we think that it is for Ghanaians to judge in practice whether or not the body that they see named the special prosecutor, functions independently of the political office holders. So that is empirical independence. We may give it all of the legal uh, attributes of legal independence and yet not have empirical independence. So we are more interested in the latter. But what we consider special about this office is that it is special because it, it is going to be the first time that we have a single purpose single mandate anti-corruption fighting body in Ghana. That is special enough because so far all of our anti-corruption agencies, whether it is the, uh, uh, the police, whether it's the Attorney General's department, whether it's Shraj, whether it's Yoko, all of them have been mixed mandate bodies. In addition to fighting corruption, they do many, many other things. And therefore, they are not necessarily compelled to keep a clear and singular focus on fighting corruption. We believe that segregating the corruption function and placing it under the jurisdiction of a single body that focuses only on corruption and nothing else is what makes this special. And our comparative study of successful anti-corruption bodies globally suggests that one of the key attributes of those successful cases is the fact that they are single mandate anti-corruption bodies. They do not mix corruption with other things. Uh, because if you mix corruption with other things, administrative justice, human rights, whatever other things you mix them with, you can discharge those other functions just as well without doing anything about corruption and still justify your presence as a public agency. We think that having this body do nothing but anti-corruption is what makes it special and we think it is worth the effort. So we'll give you just a few uh, highlights of what we have done in our memorandum. What we did is essentially divide up the bill into two. The first portion dealing with structure and governance, and then the second, the latter portion dealing with operational things, most of which have to do with proceeds of crime and how you recover proceeds of crime. Because what this bill seeks to achieve is not merely investigate and prosecute corruption, but also recover the proceeds of corruption so that corruption doesn't pay. And we think that last bit is, is a key point, point, point to consider. So first, on the establishment of the Office of the Special Prosecutor, which is Clause 1. What we have noted in Clause 1 is an interesting point, which is that this is called the Office of the Special Prosecutor. 
Is there something to calling it an office? We note that, not to, to nitpick, but we have observed that there are many different formulations under which public bodies are established these days. There are authorities, there are centers, there are boards, there are any number of names or nomenclature that are given to the established, uh, newly established public bodies. We want to find out whether it matters that this is called an office as opposed to, say, an authority. Because we note that in the uh, National Anti-Corruption Action Plan, there is talk there of an independent prosecution authority. And so we also want to know if it matters as a matter of law or practice that this is called an office. Our concern here is not just in the name. We would want to see the office become as effective as possible, and therefore whatever organizational form or whatever format that the law allows to be deployed to set up this office is what we are asking for. So if it's, if it's more effective as an authority, um, the honorable members would know, having been the ones to legislate these bodies into being, if it is more effective as an authority, we would want it called an authority and given the necessary tools and powers that authorities have. So we are flagging that just uh, as an important point to note. On the functions of the office, clause three, we uh, made a few notations. The, the first two portions of, of that, of the clause, uh, identify the two main laws that the special prosecutor will be taxed with enforcing. Uh, that is the, uh, uh, the, the Public uh, Procurement Act and secondly, the Criminal Offenses Act. So those portions of the Criminal Offenses Act that speak to corruption or corruption related offenses. There is in uh, subclause 1C, we are not exactly sure, after those first two clauses, what subclause 1C uh, tries to accomplish. What we have read it to mean is that there is an attempt here to provide, and if we are wrong, then we would propose that this is what it should be, that there is a catch-all clause. So the first one deals with uh, 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 public procurement, the second with criminal offenses. We would also want to see a third clause that essentially is a catch-all clause in the sense that it catches every other law that deals with corruption that may not be covered under the Public Procurement Act or under the Criminal Offenses Act. We, we suspect that there are laws, especially organizational laws, establishing various bodies, whether it's the GRA or customs or some other laws, that may have special provisions in there that are pertinent to corruption. And, and we would propose then that there be a catch-all uh, provision that doesn't uh, specifically get at Criminal Offenses Act or Public Procurement Act, but all other laws out there that have uh, corruption-related provisions. Then in subclause 1G, we note that the, it, it, it says that the uh, special office will have power to receive complaints and leaves it at that, right? That the office will receive complaints and then uh, uh, it leaves it at that. And we suggest that it not only just receives complaints, but also act upon those complaints. In addition to complaints, we have added end information. Because when you look at clause 26, which talks about the procedure for uh, complaints, there's a certain formality about the complaint. And yet we believe that in fighting corruption, room must be left for the office to act on tips, on leads, on information from people who would want to revoke the protections of the Whistleblower Act, for example, and who would want anonymity for one reason or the other. And therefore, a formal complaint procedure, in our view, would unduly handicap the work of the office. We've also proposed that uh, and I think uh, one of the earlier uh, uh, honorable members mentioned this, that there be a provision on referrals that the office shall receive and act upon referrals made to it 
by and as a result of investigations of alleged corruption or corruption of digital offenses carried out by the Auditor General, the Commission for Human Rights and Administrative Justice, or any other public body. That's one recommendation we're making for addition. Uh, currently, there isn't really a process. There isn't a really a process by which, or there is no destination uh, for the Auditor General's uh, uh, findings uh, to be lodged. Shraj also has power to investigate corruption but does not have the mandate to prosecute them. And we believe that if this body, the Spe Office of Special Prosecutor, can become ultimately the forum where uh, findings of these two anti-corruption bodies could be referred to for further action. So we propose a specific clause to be added for that purpose. Our main objection in this bill, actually, centers around sub-clause 4 of clause 3, functions of the office, sub-clause 4. And we respectfully strongly object to the inclusion in this bill of this sub-clause 4 and would advise that it be deleted in its entirety. This is our reason. Our interpretation of sub-clause 4 is that it purports to draw a distinction between petty corruption and grand corruption, and to confine the mandate of the special prosecutor to cases of grand corruption. That would ordinarily sound uncontroversial and indeed quite laudable. However, when you look at surplus four, when you read it closely, it is couched in such broad and vague terms that if enacted into law, we believe it would serve only to invite constant and needless litigation over the mandate or jurisdiction of the office. Worse still, the language used in subclause 4, and let me give you some, a flavor for some of the language, a vast quantity of assets, a substantial portion of the resources of the country, threat to the stability of the country, threat to the substantial development of the country. These are the conditions under the bill under which the jurisdiction of this office could be activated. And we believe that language of this kind is bound to present courts, even courts, invited to interpret and apply them with grave difficulty and uncertainty as to the practical meaning of those terms. Moreover, and more substantively, we think the distinction that the bill attempts to draw between petty corruption and grand corruption proceeds on a rather false assumption that cases of corruption can easily or neatly be separated out into those that are petty and those that are grand. In practice, corruption is not so easy to categorize at the outset. The nature of corruption cases is such that a matter might appear petty on the face of it uh, initially, and yet in the aggregate, it would involve substantial amounts of widespread racketeering. Similarly, what might appear initially to be a case of grand corruption could turn out, disappointingly, to be a case of rather petty uh, corruption, not warranting the expenditure of scarce investigative resources. The best policy, therefore, in our view, is to leave it to the judgment of the Office of the Special Prosecutor and its team of professional investigators and, 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 and prosecutors to determine on the basis of the accumulative experience and assessment of the available evidence, whether a particular case of alleged corruption is worth the commitment of the scarce resources of the office. Note that the office is not going to have limitless resources. It is going to be an office in Ghana. Right? It cannot have limitless resources as a practical matter. No office can. So in reality, the constraint of limited resources coupled with the fact that the operational resources of the office would depend in part on the office's ability to recover substantial proceeds should be expected to discipline the Office of Special Prosecutor to chase, to not to chase after low value cases. The fact that the mandate of the office is already limited principally to alleged corruption involving public offices and politically exposed persons, in our view, is sufficient indication that the policy of the law is that the OSP would devote its scarce resources to high value targets, not small fish. So we, we do not think that the provision uh, that is presently there, uh, subclause, subclause 4 of uh, clause uh, 3, 
uh, 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 has much use uh, in this regard. We also have a few comments on the governing body of the office, uh, clause 5. When you look at the composition of the office, it principally comprises officials or representatives from agencies with some expertise or role in the investigation of corruption or corruption-related office. So you have on the, on, the, on the board representatives of the Ghana police, the security uh, agencies, somebody appointed by the Minister for Security, the Financial Intelligence Centre, Shraj, and such other bodies. So when we look at that kind of a board, first of all, there are indeed questions whether or not you should have a board for this kind of a body. We notice that that is established legislative drafting practice, uh, which could be quite costly and quite problematic because then each time you create an office, you have to create a board. Uh, we, are not, we don't think that we have enough time to, to, to fight this particular one at this time. But uh, what we are at least comforted by the fact that the board appears to be designed to facilitate interagency coordination. If that's the role of the board, we are all for it. Right? But in that regard, it is not clear to us that it is necessary to include in the board a private legal practitioner nominated by the Ghana Bar Association. Right? We think that it would make more sense, given the interagency character of the board, to replace the GBA nominee with a representative of, say, the Public Services Commission or, or Yoko. We further suggest that in the interest of effective interagency coordination and in deference to the usual hierarchical structure of the respective public, the respective public officers represented on the board, the one representative of the Ghana police, for example, and the representative of the commission, uh, Shraj, should be nominated by the Inspector General of Police and the Commissioner of Shraj, respectively. As it currently reads, it appears that the, the president can just go into these organizations and pick anybody who meets the criteria and put them there. We think that it unduly undermines uh, the institutional hierarchy, and especially in the Shraj case, it may be quite problematic since it's an independent constitutional body. So we have a few provisions on that. We have many other provisions on the board, but we, we, we would leave them uh, to be dealt with. I mean, we would leave the memorandum with you, and, and we would also like to uh, inform you that the memorandum has been updated since it was formally submitted. The other one, the other issue we want to touch on is nomination and appointment of the special prosecutor, clause 12. Now, it is not clear to us, uh, the provision, the bill as it currently reads, uh, says that among the qualifications for the office holder would be uh, someone who possesses the relevant expertise in corruption matters. Well, it is not clear to us what particular previous experience, training, job, or career would qualify a person or lawyer to be one who possesses the relevant expertise in corruption matters. So we respectfully suggest that this particular qualification for appointment be deleted as it is likely to invite unnecessary disputation or unduly limited, limit the ability of the Attorney General to nominate a suitable candidate for appointment. We believe that there, may, there are other more germane things, non-partisanship and other, other criteria that uh, are more important than just looking in Ghana for somebody with expertise in corruption matters. The sub-clause 2 of clause 12 deals with the nomination process. We believe it's, a, it's, a, it's an important, uh, the, the important part of the bill, uh, this nomination of the special prosecutor in the Attorney General. So there are three parties involved here. The Attorney General nominates, Parliament approves, and the President appoints. And our understanding of the way this works is that the last bit of the process is merely perfunctory. That once the Attorney General has nominated and Parliament has approved, the President's appointment is a nominal, is a nominal function. So that the effective power of nomination in this process, we believe, rests with, of selection, rests with the Attorney General. Now, we, we think this is important for the reason I mentioned earlier, that because the power of the 
of, of prosecution belongs constitutionally to the Attorney General, it would raise constitutional difficulties where the Attorney, Attorney General to be kept out of the process of appointing the person and for the President to use his executive authority to appoint somebody who exercises power that the Constitution has vested exclusively in the Attorney General. So we believe that the appropriate process to retain the dignity of the office, it's okay for the president to do the appointment at the back end of the process, but for the front end of the process to be controlled by the attorney general who does the effective nomination. So that the person who results from this process will be the person that the attorney general has actually picked. Now, at the same time, right, we are mindful of the fact that the issue here is one of independence and therefore transparency in the front end of that process we we think that for the sake of building public confidence in the impartiality of the special prosecutor and the deputy special prosecutor that the selection of the nominee by the attorney general must be done through a process that is transparent open and inclusive instead of single-handedly naming the nominee without recourse to any public process or consultation we believe the Attorney General should invite applications from suitably qualified and interested candidates, preferably by advertising the position. Applicants could then be put through a series of screening interviews conducted by an ad hoc panel set up for the purpose by the Attorney General, comprising persons dominated by stakeholder groups or institutions including the civil society, business community, traditional authorities, the clergy, media, the Public Services Commission. That hard-up panel will present the Attorney General with a final short list of two or three candidates, out of which the AG would nominate one uh, for vetting and approval by Parliament and subsequent appointment by the President. We're, we're, we're advocating all of these safeguards in order to meet both the political goals of the bill and the constitutional constitutional consent. We want, a, a, a politically, we want an office that gains public confidence from the beginning as independent, and yet we also want an office holder who is indeed uh, uh, ultimately accountable to the Attorney General as the person who holds the constitutional and prosecutorial power. Clause 5, uh, sub-clause 5 of Article 12, uh, requires that upon appointment, the special prosecutor would become one of those office holders under our laws who must make a declaration of his assets and liabilities uh, to the Attorney General. Uh, there, is, there is a small, there's a small uh, error which we believe actually emanates from the Constitution itself. So uh, we, we note that when you look at the constitutional provision in question, which is Article uh, 28. Uh, six one. Uh, it says that the office holders who are covered by this provision must uh, make a declaration both of their make a declaration of their assets or liabilities. Now we've always note that, noted that that is wrong, uh, uh, even though it's in the constitution. And that's what you really mean to say, because what you really want to get at is the net worth of the declarant, and therefore it must be both assets and liabilities. So that's just a, a, a minor detail, but we, we don't want. To, to, to leave room for much litigation. So we believe in subclause 5A, the, 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 the word that separates subclause 5A from B must be the conjunctive end, end not the disjunctive or. But we are, we are very much in favor of applying the asset declaration regime to both the special prosecutor and the deputy special prosecutor. We, however, do not think it is enough to subject only these two office holders to the asset disclosure regime. The career staff of the Office of Special Prosecutor, including investigators, must be similarly subject to these provisions, in our view. The law must also place an obligation on the board of the Special Prosecutor in consultation with the Attorney General to develop and enact a code of conduct binding on all officers and staff of the OSP and to implement it within six months of the establishment of the office. So far, there is missing from this bill a code of conduct applicable to the office. 
uh, that could be covered under regulations that would subsequently be enacted. Uh, but on the, on the point of the regulations, it is covered by uh, Clause 76. Uh, Clause 76 authorizes the uh, minister, this being the Attorney General, to uh, uh, enact regulations, make regulations to flesh out a number of details uh, to operationalize this bill. Uh, we note two things about that. One, there is no obligation to do it. It is a may. We, we don't think that's sufficient. We think that it should be uh, a shall, that the, uh, the Attorney General or the Minister shall make those regulations because many of the things that are covered under those regulations are meant to operationalize this office. Without them, the office would not become very operational. So the obligation must be imposed on the Attorney General subsequent to passage of the bill to make those regulations and to make them within a time setting. It's an omission in many of our, our laws and the Constitution also that sometimes obligations are imposed but no time is allowed for them, for those obligations to be exercised. We believe in this case a maximum period of three to six months should be uh, specified in the law so that the Attorney General shall proceed to make those regulations to flesh out the operational details of the law. Subclause 8 of uh, Clause 12 deals with vacancy. And again, we are happy that this provision is in the bill. Uh, many, many, I mean, the practice has been that there are vacancies in many significant public offices, and then the vacancies are filled by indefinite acting appointments that undermine the security of tenure and the independence of the office holders. And as a coalition, we propose this uh, uh, addition of this. So instead of having the president appoint some other, but we still have some concerns here, which is what I'm raising. Instead of having the president appoint some other person as special prosecutor in an acting capacity for up to six months, which is what the current bill says, upon the occurrence of a vacancy in the special prosecutor's office, the current bill says the president shall appoint some other person to act for six months before a replacement is made. We think that that is needless. Why not simply apply the provision of Clause 16, subclause 2, and have the Deputy Special Prosecutor, who is a uh, pro uh, provision for which is made in this bill, to act in the position until a new substantive Special Prosecutor is appointed in accordance with the statutory appointment process. So we believe that uh, the, the Deputy should step into the shoes of the Special Prosecutor if a vacancy were to occur, and we also think that six months is too long a time to keep a vacancy in the substantive position of a special prosecutor open. Between three and four months, or more specifically, and in, in these cases we, we also suggest more use of days rather than months, because you can calculate days better. So 90 to 120 days, for example, uh, we would suggest seems more appropriate for any vacancy to be filled by the appointment of a substantive office holder. Um, then, one of our major, major concerns is the appointment of other staff, Clause 20. Now, this may well be a matter of, again, legislative drafting practice, uh, which has become institutionalized, and we, we, we've had some conversations around this and what we're told is that it is the Constitution that requires that it should be done that way. So subclause one. Well, so this provision appears, subclause one of clause 20, appears to be a very standard uh, boilerplate provision that you find in many of our laws establishing public agencies. But we, we, begin, we are beginning to question its value uh, or necessity, at least in this case. So in theory, one could argue that every person who is employed in any capacity or agency within the executive branch of government holds their position as an appointee of the president. That is the theoretical fact. Right? We do not think, however, that this idea means that or this idea ought to be taken in a literal fashion. Right? As to do so, would make the president the exclusive or ultimate appointing authority, in fact, for every office or position in every public agency established by statute, 
We feel strongly that inclusion of this provision in the enacted law, with its implication that the staffing of the entire Office of Special Prosecutor is a prerogative of the President, whether or not he exercises it in fact, right, would make nonsense of the whole notion of establishing a specialized anti-corruption investigative and prosecution body that is operationally autonomous of the executive. We suggest that this provision and the related subclause too be deleted in their entirety. We think recruitment of personnel for the Office of Special Prosecutor should be the responsibility of the Special Prosecutor with a role for the board in the case of recruitment of management level personnel of the office as under clause 19. In the alternative, if this proposal is, is not acceptable, in the alternative, we propose that if subclauses one and two must be retained in the bill, we propose that the president undertake immediately upon the appointment of the special prosecutor to delegate to the special prosecutor formal appointing authority in respect of other personnel or staff of the office. Without that authority to staff the office, the special prosecutor would be severely handicapped in his or her ability to lead and ensure the operational autonomy of the office of special prosecutor. There is a subclause three, uh, and we also have a, a, a little comment on that subclause three of clause 20, uh, which deals with secondment of other public or transfers or secondment of other public officers to the office. We know that this being a new office that comes much later after other investigative bodies have been established, at least in the very initial years, the office may have to rely for experienced uh, investigative personnel uh, on established public bodies. So secondments and transfers are something that we should anticipate. And I think it is okay and rightful that the bill anticipate that. But the provision does not state or indicate who may transfer or second other public officers to the office of the special prosecutor. Again, in order to preserve the institutional and operational autonomy of the office, any secondment of personnel from other public agencies to the office must be upon the express request of the special prosecutor and agreed between the special prosecutor and the relevant agency, possibly in consultation with the Public Services Commission. That's our recommendation. So that, again, the office maintains full operational control of personnel matters uh, within the ambit of the office. There is, uh, in, in, the, in the second portion of the bill, which deals with the operational matters, especially dealing with recovery of proceeds of crime, the main idea there we agree is that it really gives the office the tools uh, to go after the proceeds of corruption. So that's what the second part of the bill deals with largely. And this is important because there are uh, on many occasions uh, you will go after corruption, but then the process of corruption are fungible and they have legs. They can move from this jurisdiction and therefore from outside the jurisdictional control of the prosecutor. They can move to some other jurisdiction, which may make it difficult to reach, even though there are mutual assistance, legal assistance provisions here. Uh, also, the assets may be dissipated in the course of the investigation so that by the time you spend scarce resources going after the target, you would find that there is nothing to get. It's all been squandered. And you are left with a custodial sentence when in fact what you need is the money or the assets. So these initial tools are there to allow the Office of Special Prosecutor to get at the assets early in the stage when investigations begin. So there are, there are, there are three different uh, um, opportunities that the, the bill gives to the special prosecutor, depending on the state of the investigation, to go after some assets with court order most of the time, initially uh, to do it administratively, but within a very short period of time to secure court order. The idea here is to balance the rights of the property owner or the target and sometimes of third parties with the need to secure or lay hands on these assets before they run away or before they are dissipated. So this bill attempts to strike that balance because we need to do this 
also with a view not to trample upon the rights of citizens or third parties. So the, com the comments we have here would be comments that where we do not think that the protections for the rights of third parties are robust enough, we recommend that they be shored up. And where we think that the tools or the powers given to the special prosecutor to get at assets early in the investigation are not sufficient, then we recommend that uh, more of those powers be given. So I will not walk you through those provisions. I'll just give, I just uh, think it's sufficient so that uh, we can conclude quickly. Uh, it's sufficient to lay out the idea that we have here or the logic behind the recommendations we've made. So let's jump to clause 74. Collaboration with other public agencies. Uh, this is one of the uh, uh, updates we have made to the memorandum we submitted last Thursday. So there is, a, a, in this clause, a duty to cooperate. Right? So th this bill imposes on any public officer a duty to cooperate with the office, failing which the uh, office holder uh, uh, would be subject to possible criminal liability. Right. But it is couched in terms of corporate, and we, we do not think that that gives sufficient guidance as to exactly what it is that one must cooperate with. So looking at some other laws, including uh, the, uh, the, the act establishing the Director of Public Prosecutors position in Kenya, and other places we've looked at some other laws and we think that while it is okay to impose on public officers a duty to cooperate with the office of special prosecutor in the performance of its work and to attach criminal sanctions for unreasonable failure to do so there are practical difficulties with enforcement of the provision that arise primarily from the vagueness of the duty to cooperate and how to determine when that duty has been breached. A better approach in our view would be to indicate a clear or specific communication or demand of the Office of Special Prosecutor to a particular public officer that would give rise to the duty and the non-performance or disobedience of which shall constitute the offending violation or breach. So for example, the law could empower or authorize the special prosecutor to direct or instruct a public officer or agency in writing to perform a certain specific task, release certain documents, investigate a particular target, provide a certain report, for example, that is in the custody of that officer. And if that direct written communication from the special prosecutor is then breached willfully or unreasonably by the officer to whom the directive is is, is, is directed, then we think that uh, we have enough to say that there has been a breach of a duty that is binding on that officer. Rather than just have this vague uh, 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 duty to cooperate, uh, which would become difficult uh, to operationalize in, in fact. Then there is also the, uh, and I think this will probably be the end of my uh, oral presentation, the, uh, one of the duties of the law is that it allows the special prosecutor to go after proceeds of crime um, at different stages of the investigation to freeze, begins with a freezing order, where once the investigation begins, you can have an order uh, to freeze certain assets and then to hold them to prevent them migrating uh, to other jurisdictions or being dissipated. And then as the investigation proceeds and you gather more and more evidence of wrongdoing uh, uh, to go when the, the investigation is over, you have a conviction to go for uh, additional orders to actually uh, take the property, confiscate the property, and then to realize them by, by, by selling or liquidating them. And the proceeds of this process is part of what funds the office, so that the office becomes somewhat self-financing. Even though we note that under the provisions on funds of the office, um, going back to uh, clause, 
Um, uh, just a quick going back to clause 21. Thank you. To clause 21 does not actually specify the proceeds realizable property as part of the funds of the office. We think that it should be there specifically, right? So even though it says the funds include, it's, it's inclusive, so it can include it, but we think that it should be defined specifically to include the office of the special prosecutor's statutory share of the proceeds of realizable property as provided for in clause 69.1. So that, because at the end of it, once property has been realized, a court is allowed under this mechanism, the court then would, would, would divide up the proceeds. The Office of Prosecutor, uh, Special Prosecutor gets 40%. Um, some other relevant institutions, which are defined, those institutions that assisted the office in the investigation and who also used up some of their resources, are allowed a certain share of the proceeds. What is missing in our view is the citizen who provided the tip or the information or the complaint that triggered the investigation. We believe that this is the opportunity here to also incentivize citizens so that they can have an incentive to fight corruption. Even though we, we think that we all should be civic minded and altruistic, it, it, in many places, in, in the United States for example, people think that, well, why is it that the lawyers when you look at a lot of laws in the U.S., for example, there are attorney's fees provisions in there that are the sweetener in the deal. That's why attorneys on their own go after certain things in the U.S. There are actually incentives in the law such that when you succeed in going after public corruption or some other crime, you are given a pretty substantial bounty at the end of it. And a number of law firms survive on that, actually. They chase after securities fraud, for example. A whole law firms just do their work. They just find the right plaintiff, and they prepare you for trial. So we think that this incentive for citizens to uh, get part of the so-called bounty or the relative property at the end of a successful prosecution would be a very good incentive to give to citizen activists who go after corruption oftentimes at severe risk to themselves. <laughs>